Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we are continuing our discussion on Secret Wars. We are picking up with part five. So the conclusion comes tomorrow, which is actually gonna be kind of cool. Here's a funny thing. I was looking through the comments of the last video and people were like, Spider-Man doesn't become Venom in this thing. He's just wearing the Venom symbiote. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of interesting. My thought process is if the symbiote bonds itself to Spider-Man and then leaves Spider-Man and bonds itself to Eddie Brock and starts calling itself Venom, it was always Venom. So Spider-Man became Venom. I guess at that point, you're really just kind of arguing for the sake of arguing, but nonetheless, it's it's interesting, right? It's, it's one of those, those funny little things. It seemed like people were splitting hairs in the comments and I was like, eh, it's all the same thing. So in the, the last video, we basically ended off with Galactus finally activating his world consuming machine, right? And beginning the process of basically starting to like consume the world. And this is one of the crazy things because the heroes' lives literally rest on the shoulders of their ability to defeat Galactus here. And one of the funny things, this is one of the things we've talked about so far, is that Galactus has kind of been gearing up to do this for a while. And that's one of the things to bear in mind when it comes to Galactus preparing to consume a world in Marvel Comics, is it doesn't happen like that, right? It takes time. Like, it takes a while for him to start gathering his energies and to basically start, you know, consolidating all of his machinery and then activating the machinery and then kind of going at it. Now, the funny thing about this, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, is that Galactus doesn't really need the machinery per se, but it does help. Because of that, when the various heroes start trying to slow down Galactus and start facing off against him, one of the things he does is he kind of starts, he sends out what they refer to as a fly swatter, right? Now, this is just one of the many devices he has on his uh, world ship that basically allows him to deal with various foes. Now, at the end of the day, and this is one of the things to understand here, at the end of the day, Galactus is just keeping them at bay. That's really all it is, right? It's just kind of a way to just sort of keep them, keep them busy with something else while he's able to do his own thing. The truth of this is that if Galactus wanted to, he would just kill everybody here, right? He would just wave his hand and just like disperse their atoms across the cosmos or do any number of things to just kill all the heroes who were here. The biggest question to ask here is why hasn't Galactus done that yet? And we'll actually find out what it is here in a little bit because that's kind of the, the on-running question that a lot of you guys have been asking in the comments and it is one that does get answered here. But for the most part, a lot of people are kind of musing this situation, really sort of analyzing and looking at the situation, right? The X-Men are the first ones to really answer the call and jump into the conflict. Again, if you guys recall, Captain America's forces traveled to the to the base of Doctor Doom and the, uh, the X-Men traveled to the to the village where they were basically keeping an eye on Galactus. And so with the ship activating, this uh, fly swatting device is basically destroyed. But when that happens, it sets off this massive atomic explosion, right? This huge amount of energy is dispersed in a very, very small window. And ultimately it creates this, this nuclear explosion that seems to kill all of the X-Men. And so when that goes down, the Avengers, of course, or I guess really Earth superheroes, but the Avengers, for lack of a better word, all basically end up responding and jumping into the fray. But while they're on their way there, the Incredible Hulk, various other, other people are really sort of analyzing the conflict like they're about to get into, right? Because they're going to fight Galactus. And this is not a small thing, right? Like going to fight a person who could just destroy you with a wave of his hand really begs the question, what's even the point? What's even the point of the various superheroes facing off against Galactus? There's no way they could possibly win. But at the end of the day, they are superheroes and their job is to try to both keep themselves alive and protect innocence. In this instance, the various people in the village, but really more to keep themselves alive than anything else. And so it was one of these, these, these funny kind of questions because once the various superheroes get there along with Reed Richards, suddenly Galactus teleports the uh, the world destroying device away and takes Reed Richards with him. And when this happens, you get something that you don't really get very often. And this is one of the reasons why if you go and you read like Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four, there's a lot of conversation that goes on between Galactus and Reed Richards. When you go and you read some of the stories, even outside of Jonathan Hickman's run, where it deals with Galactus and it deals with Reed, you see them talking to each other in a way that nobody else does, right? Now, Reed does understand the nature of, of respect. Being brought to the ship of Galactus and being permitted to speak to Galactus himself Himself, that's something that Reed kind of takes very humbly, right? So he basically says, I'm honored to be acknowledged by Galactus. And it's one of these things where it's like, you could just destroy us, but you're taking time from killing us, basically, <laughs> to have a conversation with me. Thanks, bro. <laughs> that's really kind of what it comes down to. But he asks, would you like to view your home? And Reed says, yes. And then Galactus says, here you go. And he shows him what's going on in his home with Susan Storm, who's basically pregnant with Valeria Richards, hence the reason why she's not here right now, why She-Hulk took her place. You've got Franklin Richards there. Here's what your family's doing at the moment. And then in turn, Galactus Galactus says, listen to what it is that I have to tell you, because what I'm about to tell you is exceedingly important. And then we switch. <laughs> 
And then we jump to Dr. Doom, who basically breaks out of his facility. And Dr. Doom comes to the realization that the world ship of Galactus is the key to it all. And in order to access the world ship of Galactus, in order to do what it is that he needs to do, he ends up taking Ulysses' claw. Now, if you recall, we talked about in one of the previous videos, Ulysses' claw, after he had been absorbed by Dazzler and then dispersed onto the ship of Galactus, he was basically sound resonating through the ship itself, right? So he knows the ship inside and out, but that's not what's important here. What's important here is that Ulysses' claw resonates at the frequency of that ship, right? So for those of you guys who are really familiar with DC Comics, who are familiar with the Flash, and the Flash like vibrates, you know, from, from one uh, one universe to the next, if the, the main DC universe is in the key of A, right? Like going with musical, musical notes. If it's in the key of A, and then like Earth 2 is in the key of C, then the Flash needs to vibrate at the key of C in order to access that universe. That's the only way he can get in. Ulysses' claw is the exact same way. For all intents and purposes, he's basically Galactus' ship in human form, or at least one portion of it. And so what it means is that by having Ulysses' claw here, in effect, Doctor Doom has a portion of Galactus' ship here. And that's what he's just realized, right? That's the conclusion that he just came to. And that's why it's kind of important, because from there, what you start getting into is Reed basically showing back up and talking to everybody, and basically saying that as far as Galactus is concerned, that Reed is kind of this, this you know, universal champion of life, right? That he's a force of nature, just like Galactus is. Now, something to understand here is that it's not as though Reed has been imbued with the power cosmic or become a herald of Galactus or anything along those lines, but this is important. And the reason for this comes in, in really two major events. The first one is the original uh, original Galactus trilogy when he first showed up in Marvel Comics, right? And the idea was that Reed, or really the Watcher with, with Johnny Storm and Reed, had basically, you know, managed to attain the uh, the ultimate nullifier and, and was really threatening to like destroy Galactus, right? So it was like, I'm going, I'm willing to destroy a universal constant, right? A force of the universe in order to protect life. The next thing that came after that was the trial of Reed Richards. And the trial of Reed Richards actually came out about five months before Secret Wars started. It came out in January of 1984 with Secret Wars coming out, you know, starting in May. So with the trial of Reed Richards, it established the idea that Reed was actually put on trial by the universe, by various races, uh, for the fact that he essentially saved the, saved the life of Galactus and doomed untold billions of people to death with Galactus going through and consuming their worlds. But the response of Reed is he has to exist, right? He has to exist in that capacity. He's a universal force. So not only did Reed do what he needed to in order to save the Earth, but Reed's also an explorer of the universe, right? He explores the universe and even the multiverse, various other dimensions, different things along those lines, right? Transcending the existing universe, going to dimensions, going to the negative zone, different things along those lines. And so with that being the case, Galactus sees him as an individual who really is kind of the precipice of what humanity can achieve, that in time, all of humanity will be on, on the level of Reed Richards in the sense that they're explorers. They get out there and they look at things across the cosmos and they're champions of life. This is a pretty significant moment for Reed. But at the end of the day, and it's, it's, it's one of these, these interesting scenarios, at the end of the day, Reed basically sanctions the attack on Galactus. And the reason for that is because Reed just wants to get home, really. I mean, that, that, that's literally what he says. You know, when the question is asked, like, what about Galactus? You know, I thought that you weren't certain about the idea of attacking him. At least that's what Captain America asks. And, you know, basically Reed says, like, I just really want to get home. And so Galactus initially starts to turn the conflict and looks directly at the superheroes and with the intention of kind of facing off against them. But it's one of these funny things, because when this whole conflict is going on, initially the heroes start attacking the world destroying machine of Galactus. But the response of Reed is, no, do not attack that. Find some way to subdue Galactus. And when the question is asked why, of course, Galactus takes off and Reed's response is because he doesn't need the machine to do this. What's going to happen here is Galactus is going to go back to his ship. Galactus is going to consume his ship, essentially consume all the energy within his ship. And then when that happens, he's going to come to battle world. He's going to consume this world. We're not going to be able to stop him. He's probably going to consume the sun. And then he's probably going to go face off against the Beyonder. So all you guys have done is hasten how fast we're going to die. That's all you've really done here. And that's what makes this, uh, makes this so crazy. Because from that point, you jump directly over to uh, Dr. Doom. And what Dr. Doom has been doing was is literally cutting Claw into pieces, which is kind of messed up when you think about it. But it's kind of a big moment because when that happens, what we end up finding out is that what Dr. Doom has been doing when Galactus goes to consume his ship, he goes to consume the entirety of his world ship, that what Dr. Doom was doing by realizing that essentially Ulysses Claw was an extension of Galactus's ship, that if Galactus' ship holds all that energy, that's where it gets stored whenever he consumes things, then instead what, what Dr. Doom has done is he's basically split Ulysses Claw into parts and turned it into a kind of siphon, a series of siphoning tubes built out of the same thing that is essentially Galactus' ship. And when that happens, he basically siphons the power cosmic off instead of Galactus. So what ends up happening is that when Galactus starts the process of consuming his world ship, instead of the energy traveling directly into him, all the energy literally flies across the world and then travels into Dr. Doom. And Dr. Doom takes all the power of Galactus. Now, the funny thing about this is that when that happens, Monica Rambeau as Captain Marvel is, is basically 
basically sent over there to investigate. And the reason for this is because no one can really see or no one can really watch everything go down, given the bright lights, the vast amount of energy, different things like that. But Monica Rambeau is really like a pure light being, right? We saw that uh, both in terms of this story as well as what was established in Al Ewing's Ultimates. And so with that being the case, so you can essentially watch all this go down. Well, what it does is it allows Xavier to create a telepathic link between Monica Rambeau and Reed Richards. So Reed can basically see through her eyes without physically having to worry about his eyes being damaged. And what we end up getting here, and this is a cool thing, we get Dr. Doom experiencing the, the power cosmic for the very first time. Now, for those of you guys who read Infinity Gauntlet and who read the instance where the Collector had the reality stone, but didn't realize the full potential of its power, when Thanos took it and then used it to start warping reality around Collector, the Collector started to lose his mind because he couldn't really comprehend how reality was being altered beyond his understanding. And that's what's going on here with Dr. Doom. The Dr. Doom is experiencing the, cos uh, the power cosmic in ways that he's never experienced before. He's never had this kind of power. And that matters because this is like spending your life driving a, driving a vehicle that has like 108 horsepower, right? Like some Mini Cooper or something like that. You smash the, the gas pedal and it's like, mm, that's it. But then suddenly you get behind a, 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 like a Challenger Hellcat. You tap that gas pedal and it's like, you just go flying. It's a whole new level of power that Doom's never experienced, right? So his subconscious can really manifest all these crazy things. The smallest thought, I wish everyone would die, they would all basically die. He has to control his thoughts and his own mind in a way that he's never had to before, lest the power cosmic basically drive him insane and destroy everything in existence, right? So it's a, it's a crazy level of power. Now, this is him experiencing this and almost kind of going awry, but Dr. Doom also has an exceedingly high level of intelligence, and that's what allows him to basically overcome the insanity that almost anybody else would endure by taking the power of Galactus and then using it for their own ends. And so what you end up getting is the Avengers and the X-Men basically rallying together, Magneto using his powers in one of the coolest moments to basically lift their ship up and then fly it. But then you also get this really cool argument between Captain America and, and Wolverine. And this is one of the things that we've talked about before, right? And this is where the seeds of events like uh, Avengers versus X-Men get planted and come to fruition, you know, some 40 years later or something like that. Because what goes on is that Magneto using his power almost kind of unsettles Captain America insofar as the grandiose nature of how his powers can be used, right? The fact that Magneto can do this and he's not really breaking a sweat. Now, in terms of a, a kind of discussion of why it unsettles Captain America is Magneto sort of says, is it because of my powers? Because I'm just so ridiculously powerful? Is it because I'm a mutant that you're un, that, that you're not at ease? What's the reason behind this? And Captain America's response is because of all the evil schemes that you've committed over the course of your life. And then immediately Wolverine jumps in and Wolverine says, but here's the thing, man. Like, here's the thing, Captain America. What's going on here is you're talking about a guy that, yes, has committed some pretty heinous acts, but they were terrible acts with a noble purpose. At the end of the day, when it comes to us as mutants, we cannot count on on you. Like, we cannot count on you, Captain America. Like, you stand for truth and you stand for justice and you stand for liberty and all that kind of cool stuff, but it only applies to humans. When was the last time you ever came to the side of the X-Men when the Friends of Humanity or the Right or any one of those groups were coming after us? When was the last time that you that you showed up on our doorstep when humans wanted to kill us and you wanted to give us a helping hand? That's never happened. You've never really come to the aid of the X-Men. You fight for, for freedom in the world, but you only fight for the side of humanity. You don't fight for mutants. You don't fight for anybody else. And so before you start going out and calling this, you know, calling Magneto some kind of a, a crazy terrorist, maybe you should look at the bigger picture. Now, of course, Captain America responds by saying, well, there really is no justification for terrorism and murder. And this is a really cool, a really cool response. Wolverine says, terrorists, that's what the big armies call the little armies. That's really what it is, right? The big armies call the little armies terrorists, you know, but at the end of the day, it really all just depends on what you're fighting for, right? It depends on what your cause is. That's the difference between a person who does terrible things and a person who does great things. It's all just based on your motivations. And sometimes the ends really do justify the means, right? But it's kind of a funny thing because in response to this, Dr. Doom basically looking at everything that's going on, you know, kind of jumping back to his character, looking at everything that's going on, kind of has this discussion with Ulysses Claw. And initially Ulysses Claw is like, you already have so much power anyway with the power cosmic. Why are you satisfied with where you're at? And the response of Doom is, I cannot rest if I know that I'm only ever second best. And that right there perfectly signifies the nature of Dr. Doom. That Dr. Doom always looks to acquire absolute power. It's insatiable, right? That was one of the big points of Hickman's Fantastic Four is that when they were going going around the, the multiverse and they were grabbing every version of Doctor Doom that tried to acquire absolute power and then basically lobotomized him more or less and stuck him below the Citadel, you know, when Reed Richards of the main Marvel Universe asked, why are you doing this? The response of the Council of 
reads is because the desire for power for Dr. Doom is unquenchable. He will never have enough. He'll never be satisfied. It's just kind of the nature of his character is, is how he functions. And so in response to this, Dr. Doom does the only thing he can do. He immediately goes after the Beyonder, like literally goes and faces the guy head on. And it gets kind of nuts because from that point going forward, Reed Richards basically uses a tractor beam to grab the body of Galactus and bring him back down to battle world while everybody's kind of dealing with the aftershock. So there's what seems to be this massive battle that's going on between, between Dr. Doom and the Beyonder. And the crazy thing about this is this is really just kind of the Beyonder using his power to just sort of blast Dr. Doom, right? To almost push him away. It's not really the, the Beyonder using the full totality of its power to just destroy him. It's just kind of trying to push him away, right? Because one of the, one of the things it says is stop, you cannot approach me, right? And the crazy thing about this is that with Dr. Doom, he's overwhelmed immediately. It's, it's, it's nuts how vast the power of the Beyonder is in comparison to like the power of Galactus in the sense that Dr. Doom bit off way more than he could chew. You know, despite all this crazy power that he has that previously belonged to Galactus, he is still no match seemingly to overcome the power of the Beyonder. And that's what's nuts about that because what he does is he kind of launches this gambit and he basically approaches the superheroes in this kind of energy form of himself and says, look, I'm trying to destroy the Beyonder so we can save ourselves and then I will basically grant power to individuals who are looking to achieve a noble purpose, basically espousing the same thing the Beyonder did, but putting off this guise of like, I'm trying to save us all so that none of us die. Now, the truth of the Avengers and the Fantastic Four in looking at this is they immediately know that he's full of crap. <laughs> they immediately know that the whole goal of Doctor Doom is to take the Beyonder's power. But what he does is he reaches out to the various superheroes and says, lend me your power, lend me your abilities. And then in turn, I will channel them, I will use them, and then I'll destroy the Beyonder. The day will be saved and I'll give you guys whatever power you need to achieve your own individual goals. Now, Magneto initially starts to bargain, like uh, initially, like right off the bat, goes and runs to Doctor Doom, but then stops himself all of a sudden. But before anybody realizes that he stopped himself, you've got Iron Man and Hawkeye that jump in and they're just like, no, man, <laughs> subdue this guy, man. Like get this guy down, you know? Now, of course, with that being the case, Doctor Doom basically just sort of leaves, you know, and he's back there facing off against the Beyonder and is just almost completely and totally obliterated, right? He's not dead, but he's almost completely and totally obliterated. And so what the Beyonder does is it becomes curious. And this is an important thing. The Beyonder gets curious about Doctor Doom. And so it basically takes his body and starts scanning his memories, right? Starts looking through his mind and gets the entire history of Dr. Doom and his entire origin, right? Everything that led up to like the death of his mother, ultimately selling her soul to Mephisto. And then you get everything that you would basically see in uh, Dr. Doom, Dr. Strange, Triumph and Torment, or maybe it's the other way around in terms of the title. But essentially like it starts to pull his armor off. It starts to analyze his body. It basically kind of dissects him in and out, not in a physical sense, right? It doesn't really chop him up or anything like that, but it starts to sort of look at him and say, what's this guy about? And so before we find out what actually happens, what ends up going on is suddenly there's this massive kind of earthquake. And then once all the heroes are basically able to get out of the buildings, right, just kind of run for their lives, the various villains flee as well. And suddenly there's a massive light in the sky. And when they look up, essentially Dr. Doom is like this colossal being who's like hundreds of feet tall, as tall as, as tall as Galactus was. And then immediately shrinks down to a smaller version and says, let there be peace here. Understand, I'm not here to fight you guys, right? I've killed the Beyonder. I stole his power. There is no more enemy anymore. Everything is copacetic and everything is fine. This conflict is done. This is it. I am now absolutely God. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. <laughs> if you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.